Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Borshika Rabin, and I am very honored to moderate the first panel discussion of Capricorn 2022. Thank you so much for being here. This panel is a natural follow-up to Dr. Doug Luke's opening keynote uh, presentation on the translational science benefits model, because in this panel, we will discuss how we can engage with community, clinical, operational, and organizational, and policy partners to inform our research and work, and more specifically, to understand how we can partner with them to co-create meaning around what success means and how impact should be measured. I am very excited to introduce our panel, which includes Dr. Nicole Stednik from the University of California, San Diego, and Mr. Paul Watson and Dr. Bill Oswald from the Global Action Research Center, which is a social change organization in San Diego. They will be sharing their individual and collective experience in engaging with different types of partners. And I am also very pleased to let you know that Dr. Doug Luke will be serving as a discussant for this session. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you uh, to you all for being here. And um, for the structure of this session, we would like to propose to start with a set of questions for our panelists. Uh, they will be using um, quasi um, round robin approach to answer these questions. I will invite them in different orders to hear from them. And then we will open it up for more um, uh, of a discussion from your questions. So I would like to encourage you to use the chat very heavily in this session from the beginning to end, share your thoughts, uh, ideas, questions for us, and we will bring those in. So we would love to hear from you. And with that, I think we are ready. So um, Paul, Bill, and Nicole, first, I would like to ask you to introduce yourselves and share with us what perspective you will be representing today in this panel, and what kind of partners do you most frequently interact with in your work? And I will ask Paul to start us off. Thank you. Um, as uh, Borsica mentioned, my name is Paul Watson. I'm the president and CEO of the Global Action Research Center, lo located here in San Diego, California. And um, the Global Action Research Center is a nonprofit organization that serves as an intermediary, uh, connecting universities and institutions to uh, community residents, to organized community groups, uh, to nonprofits, uh, policymakers, um, and, and working with a variety of different researchers in areas of environmental sciences, uh, clinical data systems, behavioral health. Uh, just a wide variety of that. One of our specialties uh, in terms of the populations that we work directly with is what we use uh, using a geological uh, analogy we call below the clay line. And what that means for us is we look at community. When you talk about that term, what does community actually mean if you define it? There's different layers of it from the larger kind of institutions uh, that in there and, um, and all the way to residents um, that are not necessarily connected with other than the geographical boundaries. And so we always try to focus on those voices that are usually not heard, usually not um, really listened to within uh, research or in policy. And so those residents we consider uh, are below the clay line. It would be immigrants, uh, refugees, uh, youth, a lot of times communities of color, low income communities. So that's really one of our specialty areas is connecting those groups um, to, the, to the research. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, Bill, would you uh, go next? Sure. Um, I don't have a whole lot more that I would add to what um, Paul's saying since we're both with the Global Action Research Center. Um, but um, the way that we frame our work is around two ideas. One is authentic demand that we support communities, particularly the ones that Paul described, to um, um, strengthen their and put forth their authentic demand. And for us, that means that the people impacted by the policy are at the decision-making table, that they have access to the same knowledge and information as everyone else at the table. Um, and importantly, they're not there for input. Um, their, um, their voice must be considered in the resolution of the, or, or the, of the issue or the development of the issue. Um, and for us as a social change organization is most important is the people at the table are part of accountable and um, to a constituency. So they're not there speaking as an individual, they're representing um, a community. So that's authentic demand. It comes out of the work of the NEKC Foundation. Um, 
And the other thing um, that we do is what we call bi-directional learning. And this is where we work closely with folks like um, Borsica and Nicole, which is we believe, you know, um, we, we live here next to UCSD, one of the most prominent universities in the world. They have enormous amount of knowledge, but we also know from our work that the community also has an enormous amount of knowledge. Um, and, and so what we try to do is create the space for the university, for, for the academy and the community to share their knowledge, to address the issues arising out of the community. Um, we call it community knowledge and it's a challenge for most institutions because unlike science and technology, you can't just look it up. Um, it has to, community knowledge is held in the heads and the minds and the experience of the individuals within the community. And the only way we can apply community knowledge is to bring that community together and bring them through a structured process. And this is a lot of the work that the Global Art does so that they can collectivize that knowledge um, and, and apply it to social problems. So from our perspective, if we're, if we're developing, and we support groups all along the way on authentic demand from helping them organize to providing the information to uh, helping them continue to go. Um, and so, um, and then probably a little bit more than a nutshell, <laughs> it's the global art. Thank you so much, uh, Bill and Paul. And Nicole, I would like to invite you to introduce yourself and share a little bit about your experience and work. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's hard to follow Paul and Bill, but uh, I'm Nicole Stadnick. I am faculty in the Department of Psychiatry at UC San Diego. And also along with Portica um, and two others, I'm one of the co-directors of our Clinical and Translational Research Institute's Dissemination and Implementation Science Center. Um, I would say that before meeting Paul and Bill, um, and I'll share a little bit more about our origin story in just a moment, um, my work primarily focused on engaging clinical and organizational partners in the mental health and pediatric space. Um, since then, and since I've been able to work with uh, Paul and Bill, and really learned so much about what true authentic demand co-creation um, community engagement looks like. Um, I really deepened my, um, my work in working with community partners um, and policy partners. Um, in fact, on many of the, the calls that we have with our city and, and county policy partners, it's Paul and Bill who are the most well-known people on that call. Um, and so that's been very inspiring um, and to see. And, and so my work has moved, I think, more and more into the different translational science benefits um, spaces um, throughout my, my work with Paul, Bill, and Borshika on a few um, COVID-19 and other community engagement projects that I'm sure we'll, we'll share a bit about. So I'll pause there. Thank you so much. Um, so you all might start to understand why we chose uh, these individuals for the panel. I think having uh, this perspective of coming from the community with the community is critically important as we think about impact. So we would like to bring this out in this panel as we reflect on research. And uh, the first question, the second uh, question really is about the strategies that you use to identify and specify what matters most to your diverse partners and sharing what kind of key challenges or opportunities do you see in that? And Nicole, actually, I will go back to you as the first respondents on that. Perfect. Well, I'll start with sharing a bit about um, how I've uh, tried to identify new strategies to engage um, clinical and organizational partners. And then I, I think Paul and Bill will talk more about the policy and community uh, partner strategies. So um, some of the kind of really helpful ways has been through some of the more traditional kind of mixed methods, um, surveying and qualitative interviewing of um, invested parties. So in a, in a recent and ongoing project um, where we're trying to um, adapt and implement a family navigation intervention for um, uh, diverse families who have autistic children and co-occurring mental health needs, we, um, we both surveyed and interviewed um, multiple kind of invested parties, caregivers, um, pediatricians, mental health providers, um, and health system leaders to really understand um, their different perspectives. So for example, um, for pediatricians, as, as you might suspect, um, one of their most kind of important um, uh, indicators of success of a project is, does it take me less time to provide really high value care to my families? Um, show me how that can be done. And um, um, you know, for caregivers, it was, 
you know, I have so many other demands on my time. Um, how can we streamline things and still give me time to spend with my family? So um, some of those kind of really rich uh, mixed methods opportunities allow you to um, see the breadth of different perspectives. Um, and also kind of hone in on just the understanding that people have, you know, different um, uh, kind of measures of success and, and impact in their lives. Um, I'll, I'll share one just other piece um, kind of related to the clinical partners is this idea of iterative design. And so I've been inspired by a lot of the kind of user-centered, human-centered design approaches that have um, been really um, I think popularized in the past probably five, 10 years. Um, and what I found really helpful is if you can have some sort of prototype for people to respond and give you feedback on. Um, and I think um, that's often talked about in the kind of technology space, but I think even in the you know, community space, being, being able to show people different examples of how you might display data or how you might disseminate you know, results of your, your project and then um, getting you know, their targeted feedback on it can be really, really helpful. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there and turn it back to you, Borshika. Thank you so much, Nicole. Paul, would you uh, share your perspective on, you know, strategies around engaging partners um, in your work and understanding what matters to them most? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, at the Global Arc, we try not to predetermine uh, what is going to be, what matters most to impacted partners. What we try to do is find out directly from them. So the strategies that we use are about how do you bring different groups together uh, in order for them to collectively begin to think about these things and then begin to share them. And so we've developed uh, processes that we use. Overall, we usually call it the technology of participation, but it's really about bringing the different groups together. So as an example, the um, uh, COVID grant that we were working on that um, that was really focused on um, testing. In that one, we had, we brought together an advisory group um, that had representation from each of the impacted groups. So we had community members, and when I talk about that in that term, I'm talking about residents, folks that were living and were dealing with this pandemic. We had um, public, um, public health researchers, and then we also had clinicians. And so the, 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 in order to find out how each of them was gonna be impacted, we had to bring them all together and have them work through and tell us what it was. But what was most important about that is they could say it to each other. And so that each of us could understand where the other was going as a way of them being able to move forward around this research project. So I'll stop there. Thank you. And Bill, what uh, are you thinking about in terms of strategies? Um, you, well, a lot of it, it relates, I think, um, to our whole um, approach to community. Again, um, we when we see a community, um, again, uh, we see a highly organized group of people. Um, and um, they're, they're organized into networks that we think of as uh, social and familial networks. And that's how in the communities that we work in, that's how information passes um, is through those networks, both good information, bad information, any information moves through those networks and can move depending on the community with lightning speed. Um, and so, but we also know that those, those um, networks are organic and they exist because somebody feeds them and nurtures them. Um, and so we call the people or the person who does that a weaver in the sense that they weave the community together. So um, our approach to a community generally is who are the weavers? Who are the people in that community that hold their networks together? And are those people who are interested in, and we can work with? And, th and that can range from, you know, a grandmother who just figured out what Facebook is and shares everything to a highly... Um, formed organization um, you, um, with no Mid City Can, which is a, a large community-based organization, but it's basically these um, rooted at and below the clay line, as Paul described it, um, that has a reach into the community and we, and we develop uh, work with those. And that's where um, stuff comes out of. And so they, and like, for example, the advisory board that Paul was referring to, 10 of the members of that board are um, either 
community leaders of, a, of an ethnically based community organization or a promotora. I don't know how much people are familiar with the promotora model, but it's a model where folks out of the community, mostly women, um, become sort of experts in some area. It's often used around breast cancer and, and child development and nutrition issues. And these women then um, go into their community and educate their friends and neighbors. Um, but they also, also, in addition to educating their friends and neighbors, they gather and collect their neighbors and friends' perspective, concerns, and issues and bring that back. So it really creates this communication pattern where it's really coming out of the community. And so as things begin to arrive, if there's, and generally it requires some um, organization in that community to be able to take that and put it into, let's do something about it. And that's where the global arc would come in. One helping them establish that, um, what we call a knowledge action network, um, and then supporting that network as they begin to figure out what they wanna do, um, how they want, that's the, the technology of participation. How do we bring all the voices together and take them through a process, a consensus building process, um, and then follow um, and, and follow that and then keep people engaged along the way. I know we're gonna talk a little bit about assessing impact, but that's where the other thing that we do is um, the um, appreciative inquiry, where as things are happening and moving and changing, we bring that back to the folks who got the ball rolling and saying, is this what we were looking for? Is this what we want? Is this the direction we need to go in? Do we need to change? And so that they're, they're, um, the community is in a sense directing the process from the very beginning. Um, I will tell you as a, one who works in the community, like the community's largest and most consistent complaint with systems and institutions is you come to them with ideas and say, what do you think of this? And the answer generally is you should have come to us first and we could have helped you develop that idea in a way that's useful to us. Um, and so they get pretty tight and the more people are engaged, the longer people are engaged, the more frustrated they get over that process of, hey, what do you think about this? As opposed to, hey, let's look at this problem and bring you in from the beginning. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pause. Thank you so much. I love the, it seems like the theme, one of the themes I hear is this iterative engaged from the beginning, doesn't matter which type of partner they need to be at the table, even perhaps to define what the problems are, and then the solutions for sure and the strategies that work for them. And then the ongoing engagement I hear as well. So just a lot of pieces that I think we talk about, and then when we try to do them, it's not as easy as it seems. So thank you for sharing those. Let's move a little bit to this uh, idea of, okay, so you know what matters to the community or other types of partners, how do you link that with measures of success? And I know that we had a discussion during the um, opening panel that you know not everything is metrics and sometimes a narrative story is the story. So perhaps the answer is not the traditional metric, but what kind of thoughts do you have about that? And Bill, I wanted to invite you first to share about this notion of linking what matters with metrics of success or measures of success or other ways of defining success. Uh, Bill, we I don't hear you. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure you see this when you try to bring impact into it. Part of the issue that I see it is, is one of the questions, a couple of things always jump into my mind. One is whenever I get engaged in doing evaluation and we will do what we call participatory evaluation, um, where the community essentially designs what we want to achieve and how to achieve it, um, is that I know from my years of evaluation that is, you do what you measure um, and so you have to be very, very careful that you're not directing the outcome of the project to meet your measure needs. Um, and that kind of raises the question of measure for who, right? Um, is it for the community or for publication? Is it for who, who is the measurement for? I mean, there's two things that are important, I think, for measurement. One is, are we moving the needle, right? That's important. And um, that's the kind of research I, and evaluation I see that's really important in the, in the model that was produced is, are we moving the needle? And then the other is, are we changing the narrative? And again, I really appreciate um, Dr. Luke bringing up the, the value of narrative because it's really about changing the narrative. Because you know, the needle can move without the narrative changing. I see that in my work in organizing parents and community around school things. School improves, but they don't feel it. Um, 
And so the narrative isn't changing. Um, and so for the community, it's really about the narrative, but they're not disconnected. Because I also know in organizing that the minute you stop moving forward, you stop losing your membership. They, they engage because there has to be change. Um, and folks that stay engaged after a while get pretty frustrated when change doesn't happen fast enough. So I think, so the issue is, you know, who are we measuring, for? being very careful that when we choose our measures, we know that's what we're gonna do. Um, and that we're also very careful um, in terms of um, focusing on the narrative, which you can't do in a survey um, versus um, are we moving the needle, which can come down to counting things. You know, we've seen that in our COVID project, right? After we created the theory of change and the community identified things that would make it easier for folks to get tested and the clinic did those things, we saw the testing rise. And that was very important to the advisory board because they could see the needle moving. And again, we know that our promotors, because of their connection to the community, will take that out and begin to change the narrative um, because they'll be telling people what's happening and see it and, and then they'll begin to see it. So that interaction is really where the impact comes. And, and you know, most my experience, again, in, in social science research is, um, most of those models are almost impossible. Um, Quasi-scientific models are, I could tell stories that I <laughs> fill our time with, but if you're doing uh, civically engaged research, you don't control the variables, um, but you still have to figure out how to learn from it. And that's, that's a real challenge. And I, I didn't learn that, my, my academic background is experimental psychology evaluation with it. And I didn't learn how to do that in my doctoral program. Um, 13 statistics courses at the doctoral level did not help me figure out how to do that uh, because it's, it's outside that, you know, we live in a world where natural science models don't always help us understand the world we're living in. But, but Bill, didn't you also get training in community psychology? Yes, and that, that's the framework that pushed me away from the natural science. <laughs> so. I just... I just, right, listening to you, I realized some common heritage. That's my doctorate's in community psych too. And I, I love that, yeah, um, in, in terms of what you're trained for versus what you really need, you know, the skills you really need to do the sort of work you're talking about. Anyway, I'll be quiet again. <laughs> and, um, and I, yeah, I, I believe I'll um, turn it back to you, Bruce. Thank you so much. Paul, would you um, add anything to what Bill was sharing about impact and linking it to what matters to the community. Uh, yeah, I'll just add one other thing. And this was something that uh, caught my attention in Dr. Luke's presentation too, when he was talking about measuring impact that we have to, to change our view and perspective of what, what we're measuring or what that impact is. And I give you an example of this. Um, and this is really some of the, a lot of the work that the Global Arc does. But when I talked about earlier, bringing different uh, constituencies together. Um, the thing that I was also mentioning or didn't mention so much again is that those groups don't usually work in partnership together, particularly around designing a research uh, approach and those things. So that's very, very different. And so the one of the uh, impacts, say, of the project that we did that I was describing was the fact that there was an aha moment where all of the, the parties began to realize the value of each other and the fact that they could in fact work together and end up with a better product that was going to end up being able to be impactful to the community. So that it, to me was a tremendous impact that normally you wouldn't capture because that wasn't in the original design to say, okay, well, how well are these folks gonna be able to work together? How are we breaking down these silos and really beginning to really broad, build a lot of respect because when uh, Bill and I work in the community to try to bring the community voices together, it's, it's not an easy thing to do because most of them have always said, when we work with universities, they study us, they study us, they study us and nothing changes. Um, and so why do we wanna keep doing this dance? And so the, to be able to be at the point where we could help to design the, this research study from the very beginning and still make it impactful to them. And then the things that we've done 
in terms of thinking about, well, how do we ensure that there's some impact, even if there were things outside of the scope of the research study? Like in that case, where we ran into the, the social determinants of health with housing and all those things, which are way beyond the scope. But we did have to figure out how, do, how could we still use that data in a way that was going to be some produce some kind of benefit that the community could respect. And so I think um, I, when Dr. Luke was talking about that measuring impact, but thinking about it a little broader than what we normally do, that struck a chord with me. Thank you so much, Paul. And Nicole, what are your thoughts about this linkage? I think I just want to um, reflect on sort of a more meta level about what Paul and Bill are saying in terms of um, the just incredible value of being able to bring together these different um, types of partners, you know, the policy partners, the clinical partners, the research partners, um, and just huge amounts of respect and admiration for Bill and Paul for doing this kind of work. I, I think the engagement has been so high across the, those different types of partners because of who's been engaging them. Um, I, I think for Shika, you know, as the researchers, um, because of the sort of maybe mistrust or sort of uncertainty about um, kind of the ivory tower pushing out, you know, dictating the agenda. Um, had we been leading some of those, you know, important advisory board sessions, the engagement might have looked different and the ability to identify those um, impacts, make impacts and link those to success would have looked different. So I think it's just, I want to recognize the importance of um, how to structure those types of um, uh, participation and participatory activities and that Bill and Paul are really just outstanding in their ability to um, engage all these different types of partners. So if you can find, you know, facilitators like that, I think the impact is going to be even greater. Thank you so much, Nicole. So we have one more question that we thought we would do around Robin on. It has to be a little bit uh, shorter, so please make your story short. This is actually about the narrative. I wanted to ask you to share a project where you were either very successful in engaging with partners in defining success, or you feel like you failed or you were less successful than you wished for. And I was thinking I would start with you, Nicole. That's great. Um, I was thinking about, I'll go back to a clinical example, um, and what I was trying to do in a, in a project was to um, adapt an integrated care model for different healthcare systems. And we found um, that for two of the healthcare systems, they had more kind of technological resources. They had an electronic health record system. They had more kind of tech savvy um, uh, clients and consumers. And that wasn't a great fit for our um, partners at the Federally Qualified Health Center. So they said, you know, we need to take a pause from, you know, engaging with you. We need to, you know, identify how we can better um, uh, kind of align this model with our resources. And what we ended up finding was that they had this really robust care coordination model. Um, and they were trying to really improve and promote that so it would align with their ability to um, stay accredited for as a patient-centered medical home. So we, we were able to merge kind of their kind of organizational priorities with this other kind of clinical intervention piece. Um, and so we had some uh, challenges, but then ultimately a um, kind of a successful marriage of, of values and priorities. Thank you so much, Nicole. I think this it will be a very important reflection for us that we have mandates from our funders often, and so we, we have limits. And I know that Paul and Bill were very aware of that in our work together as well, of how to balance those two. So thanks for sharing this one way of taking advantage of existing priorities. Um, Paul, uh, what are your thoughts? What is your story, I guess? Yeah, uh, mine is, um, I'll, I'll um, talk a little bit about um, failures as opposed to success. Um, and um, one of the things that we've learned over the years um, as the Global Arc is that now we don't do a project if the project is about getting input from community members. Um, if you want to do shared decision making, we will join that effort. But if it's, if it's just about input, no. Um, a lot of times when we're working with uh, county bureaucracies and those things, they want the get approval from the community about something that they've thought out and they're gonna roll out. Um, and that really doesn't work very well at all, not to success and not to really measure impact. So we, we won't do those. Um, but if you're gonna bring people in in a true partnership, 
and help to be able to shape what it is that we're going to do as if, for example, the case that we did, uh, where we created this theory of change with that whole group and that identified what the conditions we were trying to change, what strategies we're gonna use, uh, what measures uh, for our success. Once we all agreed on that, then we could then move forward with the study and then move into a appreciative inquiry where we could monitor that and make adjustments as necessary. So that to me is worthwhile. It, it really brings about change, uh, but just to get input, um, we won't do it. It's, it's a waste of time, basically. Thank you so much, Paul. Bill, your closing story. Uh, well, like my brother, I was gonna share a, a, a failure. I referred to a, um, trying to do research um, we, we, we partner with a very um, a grassroots, fairly powerful group um, called Mid-City Can. Um, and they be, their youth began pushing um, a decade ago for free youth bus passes. And I say that because they just won them about a month or so ago. Um, but it started with a pilot project that they got the, uh, the city, the, the school district and the uh, MTS, Metropolitan Transit, to agree they would give out these 2,000 bus passes to uh, kids at five to four different high schools. Um, and then they brought in the Global Arc, we were to evaluate it. Um, and so I met with the, uh, the group, I love the name Itch, Improved Transportation in City Heights, mostly grandmothers who saw the challenge of getting around for their grandchildren, a real problem. Um, and so they pushed for this. And, and so the evaluation was based on what they saw as the impact of giving their grandchildren free bus passes. Um, and, um, and so they identified academic achievement and opportunity, um, access to opportunities. Um, the district um, and the city council wanted to see an increase in attendance. They didn't really care about anything else. And the metropolitan transit system wanted it all to go away and did everything it could to make the project fail. Um, and so they were real, a real problem in the system. And so, um, but um, we had a very eloquent, I think, design of pre-testing and post-testing and a control group and uh, monthly assessments that all could happen until the project started. Um, and it turned out that giving away 2,000 free bus passes is not an easy thing to do. Um, you can't just give them out. And it all depended on whether the high school was interested in it or not. Uh, one high school, their vice principal thought it was a great idea. He made sure all 500 um, passes got out. Another high school, the principal, I don't even think he knew it was happening, maybe 20 passes got out. Um, and, um, and so there was all this difference. And all this survey they could do during it, no, they really couldn't do that. Um, um, they thought they could, but they can't. Um, and the iPads they were going to use to incentivize to control students, well, we can't do that either. Uh, and so, um, and, um, and attendance is a problem because, well, the district has an attendance rate of 97%. Um, so it's hard to show improvement in an attendance rate that high. And if you had poor attendance, if you were a kid who was chronically absent, you weren't going to get a bus pass. You had to have a good attendance to get a bus pass. So needless to say, creating, and what we were able to show over a two-year period was the kids who had bus passes felt safer. They, they were harassed less. They saw or witnessed less issues. They were safer than the kids that didn't, didn't have it. But, and the other major lesson of this was politicians only use data that support their arguments. Um, if it doesn't support their argument, the data doesn't count. Um, and so it doesn't, data doesn't change minds at the political level, it reinforces. Um, so that's my experience um, of that. However, the community didn't give up. And as I said, they just got these bus passes um, Oh, what, about a month ago, Paul, maybe two yeah. months ago? It's, yeah, uh, about a month. Paul works a lot with the youth council there. So, so that's my, my story. Thank you so much, Bill, Paul, and Nicole. These were excellent. I am looking for questions in the chat, if there are any. I was trying to skim those, um, and I didn't see new ones. So if anyone has, we can take a question, and then I am going to hand it over to Doug in a moment, Dr. Luke. Um, if you could prepare in a minute or so, we will be handing this over to you to take it home. Um, let me see. 
Because there might be a question from Dennis um, for Paul. Oh, about thank you. Nicole, you are amazing. Thank you for tracking. Yes, I see. Paul, when you are working projects, do you, with projects, do you have an open community groups as non-academic dissemination? Um, and Dennis, feel free to uh, unmute yourself. I'm not sure if I'm reading this uh, fully correctly, if you would like to ask it. So do I have open community groups as non-academic dissemination? Um, basically, what we, the, um, what we try to do is basically, depending upon what the project is, is identify those either uh, community groups or members that are going to be most impacted or, or would have a, more information about it. And so those are the groups that we would go after. We don't usually start with one particular group. It just depends on what the study is going to be or what the project is focused on, right? Um, but again, it's it's always about trying to identify all of the stakeholders. So uh, because I think um, if if you just have a thing with just residents, with um, you're going to get one one valuable piece of information. But what happens a lot of times are like you had talked about whether you're working with policy people or, or even with institutions, most of them have some boundaries or limits to what they could do. So in other words, you're, you're not able to do everything that the community wants based on whatever restrictions that you may have. Well, it's important for the community members to know what those restrictions are from the very beginning. So therefore the work is about what can we do within these boundaries or how do we collectively push those boundaries? But um, so it's, I think to me, it's, it's really each time is really looking at who are the significant uh, stakeholders and, and bringing them together into this journey as we're starting to figure it out. I don't, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but. Thank you so much, Paul. I think that's a very important point. Hopefully, Dennis, that's what you were looking for. I also see um, Nikki a question, but I am going to hold that for a later time and I will hand this over to Dr. Luke for his uh, closing remarks. Well, thanks, Portia, and it's great to see you again, by the way. Um, I, I don't know how much more I have to add. This has been a great discussion, and I've been learning a lot listening, listening to the panel. Um, let, let me just say two quick things. Um, you know, I was jotting notes down. Um, going back to the idea of um, you do what you measure and this importance of measuring in metrics, um, and it was something connecting both Borsica, what you said at the beginning, and then a couple of things Nicole said in particular, we, um, it, in my experience as an evaluator, not only is it a, a group, an organization, a community does what you measure, but often we, the easiest things to measure are the least important things. I mean, there's a weird dynamic there. Um, and, but it doesn't always have to be the case. So thinking about um, the evaluators and scientists, when you say qualitative measurement or qualitative metrics, sorry, qualitative metric, they immediately think about focus groups or in-depth interviews. But in the sort of work we're talking about, that's not what it's mostly about. Um, using the networks that, that Bill or Paul talked about and, and the great metaphors of weavers you know, getting one new weaver to join an existing community um, coalition, that can be the most important change to document. That's a qualitative shift. That's a metric. If, if you've talked about it and, and realize that that's your goal, that's a metric. You don't need a focus group for that. You need, I don't know, attendance <laughs> lists. <laughs> um, and so sometimes important shifts and changes and improvements are actually not that hard to measure, but you have to have those discussions that you all talk about so well right from the beginning. So, so, so that's one thing about measurement. And then I, I was thinking about dichotomies a little bit and, and one of you mentioned ways of knowing and, com and community, no, you didn't mention ways of knowing, you, you mentioned community knowledge, which I wrote down as a way of knowing, um, goes back to my epistemology classes for our doctoral students. And um, we probably all have examples of the, <laughs> the headbutting that happens when the this, this scientific knowledge 
um, and community knowledge, you know, I, I don't want to get overwrought here, but, you know, butt heads essentially. And I remember one research partnership we had where we had community, you know, we had a great community advisory group. They were with us from the beginning. My, my co-PIs knew the importance of that. You know, this isn't tobacco control policy, but, you know, it applies anywhere. And we thought we had done all this prep work. Um, and, and we came to a point where we were like, this one group from a particular university, we were like, our community partners need this information. This, this, this will inform their policy implementation. And they were like, well, we haven't published it yet, so we can't share it with them. And you know, that was where it didn't matter. They, they talked the talk, but they weren't walking the walk, the scientists, because in fact, waiting for publication in terms of a way of knowing is only relevant to scientists. Uh, knowledge that informs policy implementation in the real world operates with a different set of rules. And, and you know, if, if let, let me just close by saying, if I'm gonna take one thing away from this, it's this idea that um, impact and working with communities is not fuzzy. There is a technology, I love the phrase technology of participation. There is a science and there's a pr best practice and we, we, we need to continue developing the science and best practices of this work in order to keep doing this amazing work and have it spread. Oh, thank you so much to all of you. This was fantastic. And I am so grateful for being part of this discussion. Um, thank you for being here. We are going to take a 10 minute break for those of you participating and there will be a lunch, a networking lunch. There is information in the chat about that. So please join that as well. And uh, Nicole, Paul, Bill, Doug, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. You. Thank you.